Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me on this uh, cold evening to London. That's global warming, obviously, what we are experiencing here. Uh, indeed, as Gerber said already, um, I will talk um, a bit about economics, unfortunately, I must say. Um, that's the bad thing about this lecture. The good thing is I'm not talking about traditional economics, but alternative economics. So you will see that there are different approaches. Uh, and uh, I think these different approaches are extremely important. The other bad thing about my lecture is that um, I'm mainly talking about industrialized countries and even my own country, Germany, a bit. That has two reasons. Uh, one is that um, the data situation in many developing countries, uh, unfortunately, and the unfortunately is with great emphasis, is not very good. So um, that uh, for things that uh, of the kind that I tried to show to you, it's very difficult to find uh, data for developing countries or the region we are mainly here interested in, uh, the uh, Oriental and uh, African region. There it is in particular very difficult to find reasonable data. But on the other hand, uh, I think there is a, a core of economics that is universally applicable. And I try to talk a bit about what is universi uh, universally applicable and what not, because there are several things that are not uh, applicable at all. The other reason why I'm talking about industrialized countries and Germany is that uh, Germany has gone through a unique experiment in the last uh, 15 years. And uh, I would like to quote today's Financial Times about uh, this German experience, and then I'm going to, to discuss and analyze this experience a bit. So the Financial Times, as many newspapers all, the, all, of the, all of the place, all over the globe, uh, more or less every day say, um, German, German, uh, for better or worse, many Germans feel that they were duped into supporting the euro partly as a price for German unification within a unified Europe. They have justifiable pride in the success of Germans' own economic policy over the past two decades, first in absorbing the East German wreck and later restoring the whole country's competitiveness through far-reaching labor market reforms. Does it sound uh, familiar to you, labor market reforms? That is what we are preaching, what, not we are, but some international institutions are preaching to the whole world, that you need labor market reforms, that you need uh, flexibility of the labor market, to uh, be successful in this, in today's world, in the globalized economy. This is the title of my uh, presentation, namely, uh, is it possible to have inclusion and participation in a world with flexible labor markets? And the answer will be no. But this is not bad, this is good. Because uh, the only thing we have to do then if the answer is no, the only thing we have to add is that we need a new economic theory. Not more, but not less than a new economic theory, at least a macroeconomic theory. So this is the topic of what I'm going to uh, present uh, tonight, and uh, I very much hope that it's not too much economics for uh, all of you, because you may not be uh, economists, um, and uh, you may have only Marginally, marginally been touched by economics in the past. But nevertheless, uh, don't worry and uh, don't be frustrated. It's not, not very difficult. The most important economic things are quite straightforward and understandable. So I very much hope that um, everybody can benefit from this lecture. So, first of all, what we are talking about in this today's world is a very peculiar situation. And this is, again, the industrialized world. We have family income expectations in the industrialized world in the three big industrialized regions in this world, Japan, the Euro area, and, uh, and the United States. And why do, uh, am I starting with family income expectations? Well, because we have reached, uh, for the first time, a level of family income expectations. That means the expectation of an average family in this, these regions uh, that is extremely negative for a very long time. And we have not only reached it in one region, but we have it in all the three regions. So if you take together the United States, the Euro area, and Japan, 
and you look at their overall GDP, you find a peculiar thing. Maybe you find that uh, for these three regions, uh, the famous exports, everybody's talking about exports and trade, exports do not count very much. They're only eight or 9% of the overall GDP. Investment is very low, around 10%. So what is the bulk of the GDP of these three regions? Well, it's very simple, it's consumption. It's mainly private consumption. Private consumption accounts for something like 80%. And now if you look into the future of these three regions, see, you see this is uh, up to January at least, uh, uh, in, um, not in January, to, to October uh, last year. So um, if you look into the future of these three regions, you find that we are in a very uh, specific situation, namely, in all these three regions that are waiting, so to say, for growth to come, that are waiting for a new recovery to come in the next days, so to say, everybody's waiting uh, in, uh, is, is on the financial markets, everybody, everybody is waiting now for the final signal that the recovery is there. In these three regions, you find that for the most important component of uh, global uh, of production and, uh, and income, uh, for private consumption, the signs are extremely bad. They're extremely bad. And why is that? Well, that is for a very simple reason. Take the United States. We have a, uh, we had a slowdown, not a slowdown, but we had something close to a depression, a sharp recession in the United States in the course of the financial crisis in 2008. What happened during this financial crisis, recession? Well, as usual in these kind of recessions, unemployment went up. Unemployment went up in a, in a country, in a country, and that is important to emphasize, in a country where wages have not risen for something like, well, 20 years or 30 years, depending a bit on the measure that you take, where the average real wage, the median real wage, has not risen for, 20, for 30 years. So we have a situation in the United States where uh, the income expectations have been bad already long before, long before the crisis. Then came the crisis. The crisis uh, uh, increased unemployment. And what is the solution then? What is the way out? So now, if you start look at neoclassical uh, economics, which is still mainstream economics, which is the dominant part of economic theory all over the world and all other international institutions with the one exception, or maybe the two exceptions of UNCTAD and ILO, well, you find that the very simple recipe for overcoming such a, a recessionary period in the United States, well, is flexibility of wages. But wages are extremely flexible already. And wages have never risen. That's the crucial, crucial point. Wages have never risen before. Going into the crisis was not a process that was accompanied by rising wages, but the other way around. It was a, a process that was accompanied by falling wages, the falling wage share. Nevertheless, unemployment rose. So this fact, this simple fact alone shows that something is fundamentally flawed with the mainstream economic theory, because the mainstream economic theory would only allow, always only allow, unemployment to rise when wages are rising more than justified. But wages have never risen and unemployment is high. So what happens now in the United States? Well, a very simple thing. The United States are trapped. They are trapped by high unemployment that puts enormous pressure on wages. Uh, if wages do not rise, Consumption will not rise. If consumption will not rise, growth will never recover, at least as, people, as long as people keep their savings ratios constant. What you have seen in the last two quarters in the United States was, again, a dramatic reduction of savings ratios. So despite falling disposable income in the United States, we have an increase of consumption. But as the savings ratio is, again, down to 3% or something like that, that cannot last forever. So they are trapped in a, in a so to say, self-made trap. They, they produce this trap by their, by their claim to the labor market that the labor market should be flexible. And you see even, even in this extremely highly flexible U.S. labor market, people are trying to, to, uh, to sort of say, uh, push out the unions even more, although they are hardly existent in many areas. 
so what happened, this extremely flexible labor market leads into a situation where the United States cannot get out of the recovery anymore. And this is shown in the, in the economic policy, so to say, desperation that you have there. You see, uh, fiscal policy is anyway blocked for political considerations, but if you look at monetary policy, monetary policy has done something in the United States that every reasonable person would have called three years ago something like socialism or communism, because what has the, the Federal Reserve done, they have fixed the interest rate that they are asking uh, from the banks for three years in advance. This is a planned economy. You see, there's no flexibility of prices anymore, uh, no flexibility of the interest rate anymore. So they have explicitly, explicitly, the Federal Reserve is, was hardly recognized in the rest of the world, unfortunately. But I was sitting close to Ben Bernanke in the last meetings of the IMF in autumn, and you could feel his desperation. You could feel his desperation about the situation because they did not know what to do anymore. So they fixed it for three years in last summer, but now they have even extended it to four years. Four years absolutely fixed nominal short-term interest rates in the United States. This is the end of price flexibility. And the interesting thing is it's justified. It's justified. Because this is my main thesis here. What we are talking about, if we're talking about successful economies, if we're talking about successful development, then we have to talk about inflexible prices. Not about flexible prices, but inflexible prices. What we need is just the other way around than the mainstream economic theory teaches us. And we have to turn, we have to create an economy where prices, the main prices at least, the macroeconomic prices, are rather inflexible, but quantities are flexible. What the mainstream teaches us is that quantities are rather rigid, but prices should be flexible. So at least for the for the lower income part, the uh, low skill part of the, of the population, uh, rate, wages, so to say, never rise, so people can be happy if they get jobs by cutting their wages. That should be sufficient for uh, any kind of uh, progress. But it's not, it's not. And this shows quite clearly, in my view, that it cannot be. We have gone into uh, this problem some time ago. I'm, I'm showing two or three charts from the Trade and Development Report 2010, uh, where we have dealt with that question explicitly, the question of labor market flexibility in developed and developing countries, because the paradox is what we have seen in the last years, not years, but decades, we have seen falling wage shares in many countries of the world, uh, despite the fact that unemployment rates are high and get, or getting even higher. And the most uh, recent paradox, uh, as I've said, uh, was after 2008. So, but the, the crucial analytical thing of this work that we have done in 2010 was, in my view, this chart. Unfortunately, I show it to you for developing countries, but as I said, the data are very poor for developing countries, but it's more or less, uh, it's more or less the same. Only for the developed countries, the, the structure, the relationship, the correlation is much, much clearer because we have consistent data. This data shows something that is, so to say, breaks the neck of mainstream economic theory if you uh, in interpret it correctly. Because it shows that the mantra, the idea, the ideology that employment has nothing to do with growth is wrong. Because neoclassical economic employment theory would always say, well, it's not important whether you have 5% growth or 3% growth or no growth at all. There's always a wage rate. There's always a wage rate in this world if your prices are flexible enough at which you can have full employment. There's always a wage rate. So just go for flexibility of wages, flexibilize your labor market, uh, get rid of the unions uh, so that you have individual contracts at best, and then uh, you are in the, in the best of all worlds, then you will have no problems with, uh, with unemployment anymore. This chart shows that it's plainly wrong. You have for all the, the big industrialized countries in this chart, I think we have G7, it was G7. Uh, for the big industrialized countries, you have the world is just the other way around. Namely, you need growth to stimulate employment. Even in the United States, this chart is absolutely clear and cannot be challenged. Uh, it's absolutely clear that you need growth to stimulate employment. So it's never, never is wage flexibility sufficient uh, 
sufficient to uh, stimulate growth and stimulate, uh, in, in stimulate employment, it's just the other way around. If you have too much wage flexibility, you will get into the situation in which the United States are now, namely that through the falling wages, you do not get the stimulus of demand that you need, the stimulus from the, from the workers' demand and from private households' demand that you need to get a growing economy and get catching up uh, in, in developing countries. So this is extremely crucial uh, to take note of, and it is supported by another, by another very clear uh, relationship that we have, that we find for developed economies this time, and for developing economies exactly the same, at least for a selection of developing economies where we have data. Namely, this chart shows that inflation, which is an important constraint for many developing countries, uh, and has been in the most important uh, focus of economic policy in the so-called Washington Consensus uh, uh, times of the last 20, 30 years, that inflation is not, is not a monetary phenomenon. That is, again, what every good economist believes, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. That is what monetarism has taught us over, over the decades. Milton Friedman and others have taught us that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It's always too much money, they said, too much money chasing too few goods. It's not true. It's not true at all. Money supply, or what they call money supply, there is no such thing as money supply. In no normal economy, there's something like money supply. It's a fiction. It's just an idea. It doesn't exist. Central banks fix interest rates and nothing else, uh, so they do not steer in any way the money supply. That's uh, uh, one uh, one one um, way to, to justify this uh, monetary phenomenon of inflation, but it's not, not justifiable in principle. So there is no money supply. So it's not money that determines inflation, but it's wages. And wages in relation to productivity. This is th what this chart shows, namely, uh, wherever you go, you find that over every reasonable term, short term, medium term, long term, the inflation rate is determined by unit labor cost and more or less nothing else. In some countries, very open economies, you have some influence from imports and other things, but normally it's, uh, it's unit labor cost that determine inflation. But if unit, unit labor costs determine inflation, then it's absolutely clear that the Keynesian idea holds, namely that you cannot, by cutting wages, you cannot, uh, even, you cannot even get the, uh, the idea of the neoclassical theory going, namely that uh, you cut nominal wages and with the cut of nominal wages you get real wages to fall and then when real wages fall, employment, employment will rise. It's wrong on two sides. It's wrong on the side of, uh, of say, three, four years, you get a reaction of inflation to, to wage cuts which reduces, at least significantly, reduces the effect on real wages, so that real wages are less cut than nominal wages. But plus, as I said before, plus if you take the other effect that I mentioned before, this is the so-called Keynes effect. I allow you at the end to call the other effect the Flasbeck effect, that's okay. So uh, the other effect is that if you have falling real wages, if you have falling real wages, then you have immediately falling demand and with this immediate de falling demand, you never get the kind of effects that the neoclassical theory uh, envisages, even if real wages fall. But over the medium term, we see that real wages do not fall, but the only thing that happens is that you get a uh, lower, lower rate of inflation. So these two elements, these two elements are absolutely crucial. Namely, you have a clear relationship between growth and employment, as I've shown before, you have growth and employment clearly highly correlated, and you have uh, unit labor cost and inflation highly correlated. If you put that together in a theory, you will see that nothing, more or less nothing of the neoclassical uh, edifice remains. It will all collapse. It will all collapse and has to make place uh, for a new theory. But why is it not happening? You may ask the question, so why is it not happening? If it's so evident, if it's so evident that these relationships hold, why are people still talking about money and inflation? Well, for a simple reason, for ideological reason. 
because if, and I have I fought this, this, the fight about this chart, about the relationship between unit labor cost and inflation in Germany for around 30, 40 years or so, something like that. The other side, so to say, what, what, what does the other side do? They do not talk about it, they just ignore it. They just ignore it. They ignore this relation and continue speaking about uh, inflation as a monetary phenomenon because they know once they would discuss that even, they would have to acknowledge that there is a strong correlation, that you cannot fight inflation by, by monetary policy, and that would mean that you uh, kill your own, your own ideological construct that you have built around you uh, over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, including all the nice uh, gifts that you get from lobbyists of that uh, part of the world. So, so one question remains then. Only one question remains in principle. I cannot go into all the, of the details of this, but one question remains. So what is the, how can then the, the German success, the German success in the European Monetary Union that I have mentioned be explained? This is the question of the Financial Times of yesterday. So why can a country that has done exactly what the neoclassical theory asked them to do, namely flexibilize their labor markets, you may remember, some people may remember that Germany five years ago was called the, the laggard, was the, the, uh, uh, the weakest country in the whole Eurozone. So how can such a country come like Phoenix out of the ashes uh, and, and dominate the whole of Europe in a, in, a, in a short period of something like five years. Well, the explanation is very simple. But the explanation is exactly the opposite of what people like the leader writer in the Financial Times believe. By the way, the only guy who gets it right in the Financial Times is Martin Wolf. It took him a long time, but now he gets it right, more or less. Uh, so at least he is able to learn. That's a good thing. So. But most of the others not. So what I want to demonstrate to you that my theory is absolutely right and the other theory is absolutely wrong by, by way of the German example. So this is the most critical example for my uh, theoretical approach, namely my own country has, has done exactly what was asked for and is now is successful, whereas all the others are not. So here's the simple explanation for that. What happened, I'm preparing Germany with France and you see what happened, Germany after a short while into the European Monetary Union had a, a quite strange development of the most important uh, components of, of demand. Namely external demand, which is uh, exports here, exploded, so to say, whereas domestic demand remained absolutely flat. What does it mean? Well, that means on the one hand, if you have flat domestic demand, that means it shows exactly, exactly what I said before, namely when you try to cut wages, and that is exactly what Germany did. Germany started to cut wages in the mid of the 90s. When I came to the government, uh, I could interrupt it for a year or so, but then I was fired and they went on with this kind of, yeah, uh, vice ministers are fired. My minister left, he could say, I'm, I'm leaving, but I had to be fired, uh, so they fired me and then they could go on with this kind of policy. So um, what happened, they put an enormous pressure on the unions, they put, uh, they created what was called a tripartite agreement where the union leaders even agreed that from now on Germany would go for the experiment of cutting wages or having real wages lagging very much behind uh, productivity increase. So up to that point, Germany was really a, an economy where the real wages more or less followed productivity increase, which created a normal, normal domestic demand. From that point on, it was dramatically changed, and you see domestic demand in Germany never recovered. So with the stagnation of real wages, and it was really an absolute stagnation of real wages, average real wages in Germany absolutely stagnated, we had an absolute stagnation of domestic demand. And that exactly proves my point. That exactly proves my point. Because if, if the neoclassical, say, the substitution effect of neoclassical economics would have been there, then even on the internal demand, you would never 
you would never see a reaction of internal, of domestic demand to the wage restraint. Because, because the neoclassical theory says, and I had a long fight about this with the German uh, extremely neoclassical Council of Economic Advisors a couple of years ago, and they argued, well, there can never be a, de a negative demand effect of lagging wages behind productivity because the uh, negative effect of wages lagging behind productivity would always be fully compensated by the substitution effect, namely by more people being employed, uh, and they would have the income. Uh, so per head, the income, the real wage would fall or would lag behind, but overall, the sum of real income would never fall and would never affect domestic demand. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. And this chart shows that it's wrong. I'll show you a chart in a minute where I have tried, well, just uh, for sake of illustration, uh, what would have happened with domestic demand in Germany if wages would have risen. But the other thing what happened, there's another effect that is for sure there. You can go back to Keynes' famous, uh, was, what was it, John, John Weeks knows better than me, what was it, chapter 19 or so in Keynes, the famous chapter about uh, unemployment and wages. You can go back to that chapter, you can go back to Kaletsky or whatever you want. You will always find that all intelligent uh, Keynesians knew uh, that if under certain external conditions one country cuts its nominal wages or its unit labor costs, has lower unit labor costs than the rest of the world, it will have, for a time being, at least a positive effect. And what is that positive effect? Well, that positive effect is an increasing competitiveness. You increase your competitiveness because what you create with your falling wages or your lower increase of unit labor costs, I'll show it in a minute, you create, so to say, a devaluation you create a real, a real uh, a fall of the, what economists call the real exchange rate, which, which is a measure of competitiveness. And this happened now under the specific particular conditions of the European Monetary Union. The particular conditions of the European Monetary Union were that there is no currency that could be devalued or revalued to compensate for such an advantage, an absolute advantage, which has nothing to do with comparative advantage or something like that, but we could compensate for such an absolute advantage that one country is creating at the expense of its partners. There is no reaction to that, no way to react to that. And only, it is quite clear, only after a long time you will realize, uh, the partners will realize, oh, uh, something has gone fundamentally wrong, and now here we are. Uh, we are exactly there, namely that the partners have realized uh, that something has gone fundamentally wrong. I'll come back to that in a minute. You see, there are two effects that have to be clearly separated. The one effect is the effect on external demand. If under certain conditions you do not have retaliation from your trading partners, you can beggar your neighbors by cutting wages. This will create, if nothing else happens, a positive effect for the time being, for a short time, for a medium term, uh, depending on the, on the uh, monetary conditions and the overall uh, exchange rate regime that you have. But the posit uh, on the internal side, on the domestic side, you will never have a positive effect. And this is true for the world as a whole. This is true for Japan, uh, uh, Euro area, and, uh, and the United States together. There can never be a positive effect, a positive growth effect coming from a wage cut or from flexibilization of the labor market. That is an extremely important, uh, important point to be made. So let, let me show you what would have happened if you make a very simple, a very simple assumption, which is just a uh, calculation exercise. You calculate that in Germany, instead of stagnative uh, domestic demand, consumption would have followed, as in the past, that can be shown quite nicely, as in the past, consumption would have followed the increase of real wages, if there would have been an increase of real wages, and if wages would have followed the productivity increase of Germany. That is this red line. If the real wages would have followed the productivity increase and consumption would have followed the increase of real wages uh, overall, 
under the condition that the external trade surplus is not there, that external trade is absolutely balanced, we would have gotten in Germany such an increase of, uh, of uh, consumption. That would have been the consumption in Germany if we would not have had uh, this real wages lagging behind uh, productivity, but we would have had real wages rising exactly with productivity, so no distributive effect, but participation of the workers in the increase of productivity as before, uh, so to say, a sharing, a sharing of the overall income uh, 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 between capital and, and labor, a constant, real, uh, a constant wage share. And then, if you compare this to France, you find uh, exactly what France has done. France had uh, this kind of policy. France had, I will show it in a minute, France had real wages following uh, productivity, and uh, uh, this would have produced uh, a consumption uh, exactly uh, like in France. You may ask what would have that uh, implied for overall growth. Well, again, under these very primitive assumptions, if you would have had higher consumption uh, with a totally balanced trade, so no surplus in German trade, then uh, growth even under uh, otherwise Sidorus Paribus uh, conditions would have, been, would have been higher. Oh, no, the PowerPoint, oh, here we go. Sorry. Oh, this is one too far. Oh, now my, oh, something is fundamentally wrong now with the PowerPoint. <laughs> it's not working anymore. Too bad. No, I show you on, on this chart. At least you can see what, what I'm talking about. So what happened in EMU, what happened in EMU, the non-participative German economy uh, went into competition with the, uh, with the other economies uh, where the, the names have been changed, so look at the colors, where Southern Europe is blue, uh, France is, is green, and, uh, and Germany is black. But there was a target, there was a target to be followed inside the European Monetary Union, and that was the inflation target. There was an explicit inflation target inside the Mo European Monetary Union, and this inflation target was uh, a target of 2%. This is the red line. So if you compare, and you look just to 2010, not uh, up to 2022, that was uh, planned to be different in my PowerPoint, but nevertheless. Uh, if you look at 2010, you see that there's a huge gap in the unit labor cost increase in Germany, southern Europe, and in France. And this explains, this is the core of the problem of the European Monetary Union. This is the core, uh, forget about government deficits, they are a marginal problem. The core of the problem is that we have a divergence of inflation rates, a divergence of unit labor cost, and a huge gap in competitiveness. I do not want to go into uh, the solution of this problem. I have painted here some charts to show how it could be, could be solved. It can only be solved, only one word, can only be solved by uh, dramatically changing the wage policy in, in Germany by having much higher wages for a number of years here, in this example for 10 years, and a bit lower wages in the others, if the inflation target is not violated, if the inflation target is not violated. This shows something extremely important now. I stop this because it's not working. I come, oh no, okay. <laughs> uh, this shows an ex extremely important point, namely that Germany only under the extreme conditions of the monetary union where there was no devaluation or revaluation possible, it could beggar its neighbors for some time. This is now over as, so to say, uh, Germans' clients uh, have exploited their their room of maneuver, their policy space to buy German goods, uh, they are more or less bankrupt. So the German policy of cutting wages was in so far successful as Germany was able to uh, produce the bankruptcy of most of its clients. This you could call successful or not. I would not call it a successful policy because the bill will come and the bill will be a huge bill and it will be extremely expensive, namely Germany will have to correct fundamentally its whole, its whole economic policy approach. So instead of being successful by uh, 
flexibilizing its labor market, it has done something that was uh, one could call foolish policies uh, that were only possible under the unique historical circumstances of a monetary union. I want to mention another point. So my first point, my first point is flexibility of wages is wrong. What you need is uh, very stable wages. And not wages as such, but what you need is stable participation of wage earners in, uh, in the productivity progress in all economies of the world. That is extremely important because this is uh, a stabilizing factor. This is for economic reasons, not for social reasons. I'm not talking, I'm an economist, I'm not talking about social problems at all. <laughs> but uh, uh, for economic reasons, this is absolutely indispensable to have inflexible wages in a way that wages follow uh, the uh, productivity uh, growth, at least on the average, uh, we can discuss what is below the average uh, in the, during the discussion. My second point that I want to make has to do with this chart. The second point is about interest rates. I mentioned already that in the United States they have now fundamentally changed their policies about interest rates. They have, um, they have fixed the interest rate at an extremely low level. And for sure, the level that they have fixed the policy interest rate in the United States is much lower, is much lower than the expected growth rate. So the interest rate now is close to zero. Nobody would say that the United States are not expecting positive growth rate, they're expecting two, two and a half percent. So they have uh, applied a rule that was never, unfortunately, never applied in most of the developing countries. I've given you some examples. We have looked very carefully into that. Uh, but the data situation is very, very bad. Uh, so we found some examples. But wherever you look, wherever you look, you find over prolonged periods of in, in developing countries, you find that the interest rates are too high. To make it very blunt and simple, interest rates are too high. If you look at Africa, you have in Africa a number of countries, a number of countries, not only South Africa, but a country like Ghana, a country like Kenya, uh, Uganda, John Weeks may have other examples, uh, in a discussion uh, where interest rates are all the time too high. So you have the funny situation that in many developing countries you, you have wages that are stagnating or falling because they're following the uh, flexibility, uh, the flexibility uh, proposal of the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. Uh, you have, but on the other hand, you have interest rates that are much too high. So interest rates that at least are much higher uh, than anyone in the United States would accept, uh, would accept them to be. Following the old rule, you know that uh, don't, don't do what we do, just do what we say. Uh, so uh, please don't cut your interest rates down to a level as we have it, but uh, just listen to our, to our uh, dogma uh, that we uh, try to sell to you. So this is, this is extremely important, and if you compare if you compare this with the number of Asian countries, you see a dramatic difference. You see a dramatic difference. You see that in most of the Asian countries, the uh, well, uh, clearest example is China, but in also in many, many other Asian countries, you had it just the other way around. In the Asian countries, at least up to the Asian crisis of 97, these countries were able to support the economy by extremely expansionary uh, monetary conditions, in particular, uh, very low uh, low interest rates. So we have a squeezing of developing economies from two sides, from the wage side, where nothing happens, more or less, uh, where, meanwhile, many countries have, so to say, given up to, to think even about uh, uh, participation of, of wage earners in, in the overall success. And this is particularly true if you look at the uh, whole region of Northern Africa where there was growth in the last years, in the last 10 years, but it was not, it was not shared with workers. And that is why surely uh, we see uh, so much frustration there, but that has also brought a, made the, the economies of these countries extremely vulnerable because they were just dependent on exports and uh, they never had a stable domestic demand. But the third point I want to make without showing anything about that here, it's going a bit too far. We have, we have a third 
extremely important price. We have a third extremely important price in this world, a macroeconomic price. We have wages, the wage rate, we have the interest rate, and we have the exchange rate. I do not want to go into that, but it, it can be shown again that here many developing countries are, have, so to say, a third squeezing factor, a factor that uh, deprives them of, uh, of uh, getting into a normal, a normal development and to a catching up process. We have created a world, we have written extensively about that. If you look into our late, last trade and development report, 2011, we have a long chapter about that. We have in 2009 a chapter about that. That is, so to say, my citrum sensio since I'm an unctad. Uh, we have created a world where developing countries systematically are threatened by overvaluation of the exchange rate. Because we have totally liberalized capital flows, and with this liberalization of capital flows, uh, developing countries are easy targets for uh, speculation with currencies, the so-called carry trade. I don't want to go into that. But uh, that is a factor that is extremely important in many countries, even in small countries where you would not expect it. I just had a conference with uh, uh, ambassadors from smaller Latin American countries in Geneva uh, this Monday, and they confirmed that all of these countries, there was not one country that would not be affected by speculation of hedge funds and other uh, so-called banks, what we call nowadays banks, which is uh, uh, hedge fund in disguise, so to say, uh, that, are, that are doing nothing else but to speculate in currencies and commodities. And um, so they are, uh, they are producing systematically, systematically for the one simple reason that sometimes or most of the time the inflation rates in the developing countries are a bit higher than in industrialized countries and the interest rates are a bit higher than industrialized countries. They're producing systematic overvaluation uh, of, of many countries and so to say, put a third break on the, on the development success of developing countries. That brings me to the conclusion, and the conclusion is very simple. The conclusion is very simple and straightforward. As I said before, a new, a new development model and a new economic policy model, and it applies really for developing countries as well as for developed economies, a new economic policy model has to have certain characteristics. But the most important one, it can be uh, boiled down to one sentence is that these macroeconomic prices have to be favorable for growth and have to be rather inflexible. So what you need is a wage, a wage rate that uh, supports domestic demand by at least following productivity systematically over any kind of development process, including in commodity producer producing countries where the productivity uh, progress very often is shown up in terms of trade gains. So in uh, terms of trade gains is exactly the same as uh, a productivity gain and should be distributed among uh, the people uh, in that country. Where second, where second you have a pro-growth monetary policy, monetary policy that is uh, stimulating investment in fixed capital, which needs in some countries, even in developing countries now, regulation of the financial market so that the people are, are, are not uh, using the money that the central banks provide to uh, go gambling in international casinos. Uh, so uh, you have to have a monetary regime that favors growth in terms of having very low interest rates and having stable and low interest rates and interest rates that are systematically below the expected growth rate, the growth rate that you can expect. And third, and third, you need for the third macroeconomic price, the exchange rate, you need at least a slight undervaluation or you need a, a, a justified valuation of the exchange rate. At least you have to avoid by all means an overvaluation of the exchange rate if you want to have a fair chance uh, to avoid debt crisis and uh, a permanent uh, balance of payment uh, threat uh, on, your, on, your economic, in, on your economic policy. So the, the policy concept, the policy concept is just the other way around as the traditional one. The traditional one says you use monetary policy to stabilize prices, you use uh, wages to stabilize the labor market, and the exchange rate you just leave to the market and they will find a reasonable value. That's all plain wrong in my view. We need monetary policy to stimulate investment. We need wages to stimulate domestic demand, to, to stabilize domestic demand. Uh, 
and we need an exchange rate that helps to stabilize the external account. This is, uh, sounds simple, but it's a revolution. Everybody who's fighting on these front, fronts and frontiers knows it's a, it's a revolution. We have no, up to this point, I've been sitting the whole last year in the G20, and believe me, we discussed three points. We discussed three points in the G20, just as an anecdote, as my last word. Uh, from coming from President Sarkozy, who really engaged very much at the beginning of last year in the G20 process, we discussed the global imbalances, we discussed commodity market financialization, I've not gone into that, but we have worked extensively on that, so we can discuss it, and we have, uh, and we discussed the, a, a new global monetary order, including the volatility of short-term capital flows and, uh, and exchange rates. In these whole discussions, in the whole discussion, uh, my colleagues from other international institutions were never willing, never, and there were six institutions. There was the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the OECD, the BIS in Basel, and the so-called Financial Stability Board. From the other five international institutions, no one was ever willing even to discuss one of these uh, pieces of evidence that we have presented, that we have contributed on the demand of uh, the developing countries in the G20 group, but they ignored it. They ignored it from the very beginning. They ignored every piece of it, and just the best, the best, the best uh, uh, proof, so to say, is that in, in the whole discussion about commodity, uh, the financialization of commodity markets, or so speculation with commodities, in the whole discussion about capital, short-term capital flow volatility and speculation with currency, in the whole year 2011, I was the only person ever from an international institution who would have used the word speculation. I was the only person ever who used the word speculation. From my colleagues from the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and so on, no one would ever, would ever even use the word because that does not exist. It does not exist because uh, if it would exist, if they would acknowledge that uh, uh, this kind of, uh, there is this kind of evidence around, uh, as I said, the whole edifice would collapse and that has to be avoided at any price. Thank you very much.